Hello and welcome to Philosophy 115, Logic and Critical Thinking. I'm Curry and I will be your instructor for this course. I began my college career at a community college, Cypress College as a matter of fact. I wasn't at all happy with my high school experience and didn't really expect to like college, but it turned out that college rewarded all the things that high school, or at least my poor high school, seemed to actively discourage. Instead of mere memorization, college encouraged critical thinking, questioning material, asking tough questions, and creative problem solving. It turned out that in this environment, I loved school, and I went on to Cal State Fullerton, where I earned my BA in both English and philosophy, and then went on to earn my PhD in philosophy from Bowling Green University in Ohio. Because of this background, I am very happy to be teaching at a community college. My own experience changed my life and instilled in me a real love of learning. Not everybody loves academia, but my hope is that your own college experiences are also terrific, enlightening, and positively life-changing. By being one of your instructors early on, I hope I can play some small role in this. You should note that this presentation is a very brief introduction to the course, and it is not meant to replace reading the course syllabus. Whether you end up liking philosophy or not, this might quite possibly be one of the most useful courses you ever take. This is especially true if you plan to take many more college courses in the future. This course focuses primarily on informal logic as opposed to symbolic logic, which is a lot like mathematics, though we may introduce some symbolic logic. Informal logic helps you recognize flawed reasoning in spoken and written arguments of others and helps you avoid engaging in such bad reasoning yourself. It will help you develop extended, cogent arguments, which is something many students entering college have a difficult time doing and which is in great demand by employers. It will help you avoid getting fooled by the kinds of tricks and preconceptions all of our brains are subject to. This course will help you read, write, and reason more critically. It will help you evaluate your possibilities more accurately and objectively in your daily lives. And there is virtually no job in the world that reasoning well will not assist you with. That said, reasoning well is largely about forming good habits of reasoning. It isn't just about learning logic in the abstract. Doing the weekly assignments in the forums and taking them seriously is extremely important. It is important both for your overall score in the class and because by doing this, you will be building up the habits of good reasoning that will assist you throughout your life. Learning to reason well is much like learning how to play a sport or ride a bike or play a musical instrument well. Just learning the rules of the game or the techniques to play or the mechanisms of writing alone will not allow you to perform these tasks well. To do them well, you need to practice them enough to gain good habits. This is just one reason why doing the regular assignments weekly is so important. The more good reasoning becomes second nature to you, the more you will simply engage in it when evaluating what people say and when reading and writing for your classes, jobs, and in day-to-day -day lives. Now to say a little bit about the objectives of the course. Please note that these are just the course level objectives. There are a lot more lesson level objectives. Course objectives. Upon satisfactory completion of the course, students will be able to first to recognize and evaluate deductive arguments for validity and soundness. Second, to recognize and evaluate inductive arguments for strength and cogency. There's a bit more I wanted to say about this. This is one thing that the book is a bit misleading about. It is standard, if one wishes to avoid confusion, to refer to deductive arguments as valid or invalid and inductive arguments as strong or weak. To avoid confusion, inductive arguments should not be said to be valid or invalid or sound. So-called inductive validity is just what we mean by inductive strength, so it is better to use an entirely separate term. Unfortunately, the book uses the term inductive validity. I will be trying to get you to use the terms strong and weak to refer to inductive arguments. These are technical terms we will discuss later, so you do not need to know what they mean now, but I wanted to mention this right off the bat. This is really the only thing that I do not like about the textbook, because students have difficulty understanding the difference between induction and deduction, and using the similar term makes it more confusing. If you have your book, you should pause this presentation and make a note of this, and stick it on the cover of your book so that you do not forget. Again, you do not need to worry about it so much now. I will mention it at the appropriate module. I just want to give you a heads up. Otherwise, this is quite an excellent book. Anyway, now that all that is said, the third course level objective is to be able to identify and analyze the structure of an argument and the most common forms of informal fallacies. These will be incredibly useful to you throughout your college career. You will be increasingly asked to read critically and write critically. 
so you want to both know how to avoid engaging in these fallacies yourself and to be able to spot these fallacies when others engage in them. There are much, they are much more common than you might think. Okay, before moving on, there's something very important that everybody must know. In order to pass this class, everybody must take and earn 100% on a course policy quiz. Unlike any other assignment in this course, you can take this quiz as many times as necessary to earn 100%, but you must earn 100% on it in order to pass the course. You cannot earn any points for a week unless you have completed this. So if you wish to get points for any assignments during week one, you need to take this quiz until you earn 100% on it before Saturday midnight of the first week. The quiz shouldn't scare anybody. It is simple. Unlike normal tests and quizzes, it doesn't test critical thinking with concepts or reasoning with new terms. It is simply about course policy, and if an answer isn't obvious the first time, it will likely be obvious the second time through. I require this quiz because so many students say that they simply sign the letter of agreement without reading it. When students take this quiz, I know that they are aware of at least some of the most important class policies. The quiz is to your benefit as well, since once I added this quiz, I also added five extra credit points to go along with it. Signing the letter of agreement is also required. The letter of agreement also gets you another five extra credit points if you do it during the first week. The course policy quiz is linked to in the first module of the course. This is an online version of the logic course, and there are a few things you should be aware of for online courses. Well, online courses are real courses. They are meant to cover as much material and be just as demanding as real-time, face-to-face courses. While few people like to have to do work while they are doing it, this is actually important for you in a positive way. If community colleges simply became diploma mills, the degrees you received wouldn't be worth anything to employers, they wouldn't help you earn a raise, and they wouldn't be transferable to four-year schools. The online degrees and units you earn help you receive jobs, raises, and work as prerequisites only because they are presumed to teach you as much as a face-to-face, real-time course. These courses are therefore meant to meet the academic rigor of the same course taken at any other institution. What does this mean? Well, it means you should know the standard time commitment that is expected of a three-unit course. The standard time commitment for a three-unit, 16-week course in California, and perhaps the whole country, is 12 hours a week. This includes three hours of in-class time for real-time, face-to-face classes. For asynchronous online courses, you are expected to use these three hours viewing instructional material and in other ways for the course. Please note that the eight-week courses are required to cover as much material as the 16-week courses in half the time. Again, this is a requirement. This means that the time commitment for a three-unit, eight-week course is twice that of a 16-week course. It is the same total number of hours, but it is twice as many hours a week because you signed up to do it in half the amount of time. This means that the time commitment for a three-unit, eight-week course is 24 hours a week. For face-to-face -face courses, six of that would be lecture, but for an asynchronous online course, this six hours involves viewing material online and other activities. Of course, some people work a little faster or slower, but you should realize the general expectations from a college course as you go in. The course will also require you to log on regularly throughout the week. You should be able to log in either Sunday or Monday, the first couple days of the week, you need to log in again and make your primary DQ post before midnight Wednesday. And finally, you need to log in to make a response post no later than Saturday midnight. The book for this course is Logic and Contemporary Rhetoric by Nancy Cavender and Howard Kahane. We are using the 12th edition. You are free to use one edition earlier in the online course but you are responsible for any differences. I would not anticipate major problems by using a book that is one edition older, and you may wish to do so if saving money is an issue for you. If other students start talking about exercises in the book, yours might be a bit different, but most of my assignments do not refer to specific exercises in the book. But please note that this is for the online course only. If you are watching this to get a feel for the live course, things are a bit different. It is just too chaotic if all the students are not using the same book, and I do use book exercises for the live version of the course. I provide the first chapter of the book for you in Dropbox. 
My hope is that in this way you can get the best deal possible by ordering a used copy, maybe of an older edition, from a site like Amazon. If you are still waiting for the book when we get to Chapter 2, you can email me a receipt to show that you have purchased the book and I will email you Chapter 2 as well. I am afraid that is as far as I can go with sharing chapters of the book to you, as the law begins to tie my hands. Additional readings in the course, if there are any, will be provided for you if necessary. In short, I am doing what I can to save you money. I would also like to say a little something about the course text and authority. Philosophy is different from any other classes you might be used to taking. In many courses, the course texts represent an authority or set of facts that you are meant to understand and accept. Typically in philosophy, the texts do not represent an end-all authority on what is or is not true or even what you should believe to be true in the course. This is not to say that there are no such truths in philosophy or that philosophers who have thought a great deal about these issues do not have insights, but usually arguments can continue to be made long past the end of a course. For this logic course, though, it is a bit of a mitts bag. There are some elements of logic that are deductively provable or definitional in terms of a structured system. But we will also be applying analytical skills to specific cases that affect reasoning. Therefore, there are sections of the book where the authors will be making empirical claims that may have some political implications or other applications that may be arguable, at least to some degree. The point of our work in this course will not be to simply memorize facts in the readings that you will receive. While understanding the points of view and theories of the authors will be important, you are free and even encouraged to criticize the textbook we will be reading if you feel that we were discussing such an issue. Like I said, while much logic is provable, some applications relevant to logic, such as when analyzing some psychological issues or the news, might require some level of interpretation, though hopefully what we'll be examining is what is most strongly supported by the current evidence. I want to make it absolutely clear that students will never ever be graded on what they believe in this course. They will be graded on how well they understand, create, and apply arguments, and also regarding how well they can demonstrate understanding of and make use of terms and concepts that we will cover in the course. When you write your paper, you will not be scored on what position you take, but on how will you support that position with a cogent system of arguments, and that is what's important. But nobody will ever be graded on what she or he believes. In fact, I even encourage students to play devil's advocate. That is to say, to argue for positions that they do not agree with. This is a good way to get a feel for the strength of another argument, and it is also a good way to practice reasoning objectively. So because of this, I never know what a student's real opinion is anyways. Of course, basic netiquette still has to be honored when posting. The fact that you can hold any position you want doesn't mean that hate speech or other speech that would violate Coastline's policies would be tolerated. Also, when arguing, it is always okay to attack another person's arguments, but it is never okay to attack the person or group making the argument. You'll learn as part of this class that not only is this in bad taste, it is a logical fallacy known as ad hominem or attacking the person. I am just mentioning this for completeness. I almost never have a problem with this in a class, but I mention it so that I can officially say that there has been a warning. Course Organization this course is organized into 16 modules. In a 16-week course, that means doing one module a week. In an 8-week course, this means doing two modules a week. To find out exactly what to do each week, make sure to use the lesson schedule outline as an overview, and then simply look at the information contained within the assigned course modules every week. Though they may vary a bit, each module usually contains a set of assigned readings, lecture or presentation material to help you understand the readings and or additional important philosophical material. This is usually in the form of one or multiple PowerPoint presentations. A set of form discussion questions or DQs. Usually the DQs will consist of one primary post and one response post. You're free to post more. Modules may also contain a test, quiz, or other assignment. Primary posts, unless they say otherwise, are always due by midnight on Wednesday. Response posts, unless they say otherwise, are always due by midnight on Saturday. And tests and quizzes, unless they say otherwise, are always due by midnight on Saturday of the module in which they appear. The course will consist of a thousand points total. 900 points and above is an A, 800 points and above but less than 900 is a B, 700 points and above but less than 800 is a C, 600 points and above but less than 700 is a D, and less than 600 is an F. You should note that these are real cutoff points. 
A B starts at 800 points, not at 799 points. In order to bump up a student, I need an academic reason to do so. It isn't sufficient that a student really want a higher grade or that the score be really close. Keep in mind that with the course policy quiz, the favors column, which will be explained in a moment, and the letter of agreement, you should all be starting off the course with 20 extra credit points. So this effectively means that these cutoff points are already 20 points under what they are. I do occasionally bump up scores, but there needs to be an academic reason to do so. If a student has done every DQ assignment, for example, that is important. The number of DQs done is the primary thing I look for. Other elements I look for is quality of posts, improvement, taking advantage of extra credit opportunities when they are available, and so forth. The reason I cannot simply give out a couple extra points away without an academic reason is explained in more detail in the syllabus itself. Here is how the points break down for the semester. There are 15 DQs on which you can earn 300 points. There are six quizzes. Each is worth 40 points. Quizzes individually are not worth a whole lot of points, but they are not really easier than the test questions because they are meant to help you prepare for the tests. If I made the quizzes easier, you might falsely believe that you were prepared for the test when you are not. The quizzes are meant to let you know what you need to refresh yourself on. There are three tests. The first test and the final are worth 150 points each. These consist of multiple choice and short essay answers. The second test is worth 160 points as it's split into two parts. There's a 40 point objective portion and a larger essay which is your major writing assignment for the semester. This essay is worth 120 points. Doing the math, this totals 1,000 points. In addition, if you start the course correctly, you will begin with 20 extra credit points from the course procedures quiz, the favors column to be explained later, and the letter of agreement. Please remember that you must earn 100% of the course procedures quiz to pass the course and to begin earning points at all. The course procedures quiz should be your first order of business after familiarizing yourself with the syllabus. Conversation and debate are essential elements of philosophy, and therefore even though this isn't a face-to-face -face class, communication in the forums are heavily stressed. Indeed, this course has been designed around the idea that public discussions and forums will be as important a learning tool as the lecture material I will give you for each module. The DQ forums are the easiest source of points for this course. They are graded for thoroughness and completeness, not for correctness. This means that by taking all the assignments seriously and reading the instructions carefully, you can earn all the DQ points. If you earn all the DQ points for the class, it is possible to earn a failing 58% on everything else in the course and still pass the course with the C. This makes doing the DQs a great opportunity. You are even allowed to miss one for free. At the end of the semester, you will get enough points to make your lowest DQ score, whatever it is, reach 20 points. So doing all the DQs is not worth extra credit, but as mentioned previously, doing all the DQs is something I consider if you have a borderline score at the end of the semester. This will appear in a separate column. Also, you should try to read the entire post of 10 to 20 other students for each module when you are doing the DQs. The forum discussion questions work a bit differently depending on whether you are in a 16 week or an eight week course. If you are in a 16 week course, you do one module a week. So you do one DQ a week, not on week 16. This usually consists of a primary post due Wednesday and a response post due Saturday. If you are in an eight week course, it is just like the 16 week course, except that you do two modules a week. Remember that both the eight and 16 week courses are supposed to have the same content. If you are taking an eight week course, you simply elected to go through that content twice as quickly. Regardless of whether you are in an 8 or 16 week course, it is vital that you read the DQ instructions for each module. These can vary a great deal each time. This includes the instructions for the response portion of the DQ. There are various columns in the gradebook. It is your responsibility to check the gradebook regularly and inform me of any objections you may have before the due date of the final exam. Otherwise, there is a good chance it may be too late to do anything. I try to be exceptionally careful when entering scores, but with thousands of students in an instructor's career and the chaos that often surrounds students turning in items in various ways, combined with the fact that even the most careful of us, who try to double check everything, are still not perfect, it is very wise to check your own scores. 
It's good anyway so that you know how you're doing in the course. Additionally, if you see a column marked miscellaneous extra credit in the gradebook, this is not an extra credit assignment that you have missed. It is a column that I use to balance the books if there is a problem I have to fix. It often has a very high points possible value, such as 100 points. I assure you that you are not missing out on a 100 points extra credit assignment. There would never be an extra credit assignment that high in a 1000 point class. Finally, there is the favors column. In this column, you start off with 10 extra credit points. You keep these 10 points if I never have to break the rules of the course for you, such as let you take a test or a quiz late. If you ask me to take a test or a quiz late or something of that nature, and if I agree, I will set these points to zero and then let you do the assignment late. This uses up your favor. In this way, students who do not ask to break the rules get a reward, and students who have an emergency are not hurt because these were extra credit points to begin with. It also lets me keep track of anybody who has already asked to take something late so that they do not manipulate the system by doing so multiple times. I also wanted to just briefly mention some of the more important forums in this course. First is the introduction forum. I hope that you will use this to introduce yourselves. You will be talking to each other a great deal in the DQ forums and this helps break the ice. It is also a great way to get to know each other and make new friends just as you would in a face-to-face -face class. Then there is the coffee shop. This is a forum in which you can discuss any tangential topic you like. If you find you that and somebody else have something in common, maybe a series of books you both like, or an MMORPG you play, or some other hobby that you have that you both have in common, you can say, let's talk about this more in the coffee shop and carry on any conversation you like. The raised hands form is an important form in which you should ask me questions if you think that those questions might be useful to other students. Please do not use this form to ask me questions about your own score or matters that only pertain to you, but if you think that others may benefit from your question, it is much better to share your questions in raised hands than just to email me because then only you see the answer. The anonymous comments form provides you with a link to an off-site form where you can leave me anonymous comments. I think that honest feedback from students is very important. I really hope that you feel free and comfortable to tell me anything you like, but I realize that sometimes it's hard to tell an instructor about something you do not like in the course, or even tell him or her what you do like because it might sound like kissing up. You can use this form to make completely anonymous comments. Very important though, please do not use this form to ask me questions that you really need an answer to. Because it's off-site, I only check it every week or so. If I do find a comment, I do try to respond if appropriate, so check back. Then there are the most important forums. These are the discussion question forums. Here is where you will be posting answers to your DQ questions and interacting most with other students. Also, please do not ask me questions when writing your DQs. By necessity, DQs are graded quickly for completeness and not correctness. I do try to comb through them and always pick a few to read more carefully. I then try to send out general comments to the class or sometimes post. If I post in response to a post of yours in the forum, I may not see a reply. This is just my way of giving you feedback. I simply have too many forms to keep track of to look in all of them in every class every day to see if any of my students has written anything to me. So again, if you have anything you would like me to respond to, please use the raised hands forum or email me. And those are the main forums, but there may be some other forms added later as well the academic honesty policy. Everybody is responsible for knowing the academic honesty policy and you sign a statement saying so in your letter of agreement. This is discussed more in the syllabus, so I'm not going to hold everybody up by going into detail about it here, except to say that it is increasingly easy to catch text that is just copied from other sources, and this includes paraphrasing closely without citing sources. And it doesn't only apply to essays, the academic honesty policy applies to all assignments, including the forums. So quote and cite your sources. Also, please remember that this was just a quick start guide. There's a great deal of additional information in the syllabus. You should download the syllabus from Dropbox so that you get all the appendices. The course information version does not contain these and does not have full formatting. This includes a lot of useful appendices, hints for making good posts, hints for test taking, more detail about how grading works, and answers to many additional questions. My email address is fcurry1 at cccd.edu. Please do not forget the one part of that email address. 
Coastline already has an F. Curry, though nobody I've talked to seems to know who it is. If you have technical issues, it's best to contact Distance Learning. I'm more than happy to help you if I can, but my advice is likely going to be limited to suggest trying a different browser, making sure Java is updated, and so forth. I am not equipped to troubleshoot your computer or seaport issues, and I do not have access to all the information that Distance Learning has. So my recommendation for your own benefit is that, if you cannot find a solution yourself, that you contact Distance Learning so that you do not waste a day or so waiting for me to respond by saying that I wish I knew the answer to your question, but I don't, so you should try Distance Learning. Again, I won't be upset if you ask me. I'm happy to help you in any way I can, but it may end up delaying you farther, causing you to miss a deadline, and so forth. So it might be best to go to them first. And that is the end to this quick introduction to the course. I look forward to teaching all of you, and I truly hope that you find this course both interesting and rewarding. I am eager to read your optional introductions and begin to get to know you, and it is my sincere wish that you enjoy this class.